Hello, everybody. I see you're starting to join here. I do want to test that audio to make sure that's working before we start here. So if you can hear me, if you can type yes into that Q&A box, that'd be fantastic. Perfect. I do have confirmation that audio is working. So we will get started here in about one minute. All right, hello everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. Before we get started, just a couple of the normal items to take care of. Now today is a little bit different as we normally ha have our question and answer session at the end, but today we'll be answering questions throughout the webinar. We have nurses Sherry and Carla here today to provide some guidance on a bunch of topics. And I'll jump in here and there on some topics um, geared more towards health coaching as well. We will be posting a recording of the webinar on our blog. The link for that will be shown at the end. And if you would like a PDF copy of the slides, there will be a link to download those on that same post as the recording. And if your question does not get answered today, please email our support inbox, which will be shown at the end as well. So we are gonna start with some of our pre-submitted questions. You have had about a month to put in some questions but you can also put questions that you do have by going into the Q&A box or putting them in, putting them in the chat. Um, if there are questions on the topic we are on, we'll try to hit those live as well as best we can. Um, we were overwhelmed at the response and number of questions that we've received, which was fantastic. But unfortunately, only being a half an hour, we're not going to be able to get to everything, but we're going to do the best that we can. So on that note, I'm going to stop talking and we are going to turn it over. Um, the first pre-submitted question we have, um, there was a few on blood sugar. So Carla's going to take these couple questions right now. Thank you. Thank you, Shelby. Good morning, everyone. Um, so with this question, of course, we we could spend the whole half hour on this topic alone. I know this is, it, it's, um, a big concern for people that are pre-diabetic or diabetic. Um, so I kind of just went back a little bit with glucose level and A1C. What are they first and foremost? Um, so the, blue, the glucose, um, it's sugar in your bloodstream, supplies your cells uh, with energy. And so everyone has a blood sugar. Um, A1C, uh, that measures um, usually two to three months of what that normal blood sugar is for someone. So as you can tell, that question, you know, it is if I have a normal um, glucose, should I be checking my A1C or why would my A1C be high? And so, um, you know, it's just important to remember that that A1C is the average. So you can have a normal uh, glucose, but after that big piece of chocolate cake at the birthday party, it might go up. And so that's why it's really important, um, especially for a diabetic, to make sure that that A1C is in range because, of course, we're always going to have ups and downs. Um, the normal A1C uh, usually is below 5.7. Um, a level of 5.7 to 6.4, that's an indication of maybe prediabetes, and um, 6.5 or higher indicates diabetes. So if you're in between that 5.7 and 6.4 range, um, it's just an indication that you might be at a greater risk of type 2 diabetes. Um, the recommendation for this baseline A1C, um, I know a lot of us, some might get us get it during a um, annual physical or even through your job testing. But um, the, the baseline for an A1C typically is for an adult over the age of 45. If you're under 45 and you have 
um, certain conditions like being overweight or um, a risk factor for these prediabetes, um, including family history or even gestational diabetes, um, even your race, African Americans, Hispanics, Latino, um, Asian Americans, they're at higher risk. So that's the, the recommendation. Um, we did go into the hypoglycemia. That's just a lower blood sugar, too. That was one of the questions. Um, and typically, these level, the, the normal blood sugar level is between 70 and 110. If your blood sugar is falling behind, below 70, this is considered hypoglycemia. If you feel like you're having those symptoms uh, or you have been diagnosed with this, um, and those symptoms can be, they can be difficult because it could just be, you know, maybe you're just tired or you're dehydrated, but sometimes it's a uh, shakiness or irritability, um, nausea, headache, hunger, things like that, um, even to slurred speech or confusion. Um, you definitely want to see your doctor about that. Keeping track, if you are checking your blood sugar and you're noticing that they're lower, um, you definitely want to keep track of these, what time of the day it's happening, what have you done, what have you eaten or not eaten, and consult your doctor or your care team about it. It's very, very serious, just as as is a, a high blood sugar. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that info. All right, next questions, we're going to go to Sherry here. Um, we had a couple questions on some vaccines, so I'll let you take it over, Sherry. Thanks, Shelby. Um, good afternoon. Um, I think that the question came in about the shingles vaccine, and um, they were asking about the risks of that, and is that, that worth it? Um, the typical um, side effects or risks of that are, um, you know, pain and redness at the injection site, which is pretty typical for all vaccines. Um, and you can also have some light flu-like symptoms, you know, body aches, um, maybe like a low low fever and pain. Um, but um, that can, you know, getting that vaccine, it can prevent a lot of the side effects from getting shingles, which can, um, you know, you can get the, the blisters um, and then pain, which is the biggest thing. And sometimes that pain can return. And depending on where those blisters from the shingles are at, like if it's near the eye, it can affect your vision. But, you know, if you're interested in that, talk to your doctor. Um, um, it's um, very much recommended to prevent getting, getting the shingles. Or if you do get the shingles, sometimes you can get the shingles after the vaccine. It'll be a very, very light case. Um, and then I believe the next question was on the, the COVID uh, vaccine, the booster, and they were wondering if it's better to get that booster now or to wait until maybe like um, the next version comes out. And I wasn't sure if they were talking about the next version for the booster or like um, if there's another version of COVID, you know, which we've seen a couple different variants of that throughout the last three years. But um, they recommend that everyone five and older get a booster to the shingles vaccine, okay? Um, one booster shot is needed unless the recommendation is two boosters if you're, if you're 50 years old or older or if you're immunocompromised. So, um, you know, talk to your doctor if you are immunocompromised and see, you know, if the, what they recommend if they want you to have the two boosters. But whether to wait, um, I would I would suggest getting it now. Um, um, the they say you know at least five months after you've completed your booster, you can get or excuse me the vaccine, then you can get the the booster shot. So um, you know if you're waiting, you know maybe for the fall, maybe before flu season, I guess talk to your doctor. Um, I would suggest getting it now and not waiting but as long as you're going to get it i think that's that's the the good thing so and um i believe that was it for those two questions we had one follow-up question cherry that that asked mm -hmm. about getting can you get the flu shot at the same time that you get um a covid vaccine or booster do you know that you know i believe you can yeah um 
you know, that's up to you. I would talk to your your doctor or your health care provider about that, um, you know, to see because you can get you can get those same kind of flu like side effects, you know, with any vaccine. Um, and so that may, you know, depending on your health history, you may want to talk to your doctor and see if they're OK with you getting both of those at the same time. Yep. And we've had, we have some people in the chat saying that they've gotten them both at the same time. So again, check with doctor, of course, because everyone's history is different, but it sounds like um, in most cases, you'd be able to get both, but chat with that doctor. Perfect. All right. We had some blood pressure and menopause that I think we're going to stay with Sherry and she's going to go through a few of these questions for us. Yeah. Um, I think one of the initial questions came in that this person had had a hysterectomy and that following that, um, not just immediately after the surgery, but for, for months following that, um, she's had low blood pressure or hypotension. And um, as far as that specific question goes, um, that is not common after a hysterectomy. Um, you know, I would just make sure if you did not have low blood pressure before you had the hysterectomy and you're having that now, just make sure that your doctor is aware of it. If it gets too low, you know, those symptoms are you get lightheaded, um, fainting, or your vision narrows, or you start to feel like you're going to black out, then you need to go to the doctor right then and be taken care of right away. But um, typically, low blood pressure is not common. As a matter of fact, sometimes you can have a little bit higher blood pressure after a hysterectomy. So, you know, share that with, with your doctor. Um, the other question around the hysterectomy was, you know, how do you know if you're going to, uh, if you're in menopause, if you've had your um, uterus removed? So that's a very good question. Um, when you have your uterus removed, you can also sometimes have your ovaries removed at the same time. And if that happens, you would go into um, menopause right away because the ovaries are what produce that um, estrogen, and and um, when they're gone, then you know you're considered to be in menopause at that time. But if you just had your uterus removed and you still have your ovaries, unless your doctor is going to be doing some blood work to check your estrogen levels, which isn't real common, um, basically the way that you would know that you're um, in menopause would be like some of the, the symptoms of that. So, you know, hot flashes, um, night sweats, if you're having difficulty sleeping, mood swings, there's like a whole whole list of them. Um, sometimes you can have a, a bit of racing heart, um, vaginal dryness, weight gain. So those things, you know, you can talk to your doctor at that time. Um, you know, really, there, there's no need, I guess, specific need to check an estrogen level unless you really just want to know. But those symptoms happening probably would be a good indicator that you might be entering um, menopause at that time. Um, some of the ways to fight those kind of symptoms, um, really exer regular exercise is a good, good way to help, you know, prevent that. And then avoiding um, caffeine, spicy foods, and alcohol are kind of known that they can increase the symptoms of the hot flashes. Um, I don't know if I said smoking, but that is also uh, associated with that. You can get like um, estrogen creams, vaginal estrogen creams. And then um, also there are some antidepressants, like a low dose antidepressant that have been shown to be very effective against hot flashes. Um, and you can talk to your doctor about that. If you've tried some of these other things and they're just, you know, if it's to the point where it's just really affecting your everyday life and it's difficult, you know, to sleep or even during the day, you know, you're constantly bothered by that, talk to your doctor and they can look at, at that. You can sometimes take um, estrogen therapy. Now, um, I think that used to be much more common, but they've found now that estrogen replacement and supplements can lead to you're at a higher risk for cardiovascular disease and breast cancer. So they're very selective about who um, they would treat with um, like estrogen, you know, uh, 
systemic that you would take as, as a pill form, okay? Um, now, this is different than just like the vaginal cream. So um, the oral estrogens, you know, if you're interested in that, you definitely need to talk to your doctor. Again, not everyone is appropriate for that. They have um, really decreased the frequency of, of recommending, recommending that um, for certain people. So again, that would be something that you'd want to talk to your doctor about. And I'm sure there are a lot of, I see a lot of stuff going on in the chat room. You might have like a lot of very good personal information as to what you might do to kind of fight um, those symptoms. Personally, I find that caffeine really affects um, my um, hot flashes, so I, I, I watch that. So. Um, that is about it, I think, for those questions that we had pre-submitted. Perfect. And as uh, as a health coach, I will just return back to that regular exercise that you said first, Sherry, because <laughs> for the normal ones, that's obviously a great one, and then eating well. Um, some of the questions that have come in is really based on how long symptoms last. Now, you correct me if I'm wrong, Sherry, but I feel like that's really, really individual as far as, as how long you go through menopause. Is that is that safe to assume? It, it very much is. Um, I started probably like at 48 where they say that you're perimenopausal and you're not really um, finished with menopause. Um, how do I want to say this? You're not truly in menopause, I should say. So menopause is like that cessation of, of you know, you're not having periods and that you are no longer in um that time frame where you can, you know, be reproduced basically. Um, but it, my symptoms started like at 48 and then probably I completed menopause like at 52. So two years after you're totally done with your, your period. Now, again, for people who've had their uterus removed, they can't really count, you know, use that. But I, you know, I'll still get hot flashes every once in a while. I have friends who, I mean, they're not very bad for me. That wasn't probably the biggest thing. But I, I know people who that's still a big thing for them, and they're, you know, almost 60. So, yeah, it's very individualized for everyone. And some people, some things bother them, and others don't. And that's the exact opposite for, you know, maybe even a family member. So, yeah, perfect. All right, good info. All right, let's move on. So we've got back to Carla here, kind of some uh, hodgepodge of questions on this slide, but Carla, I'll let you take it away. Okay, so can osteoporosis be reversed? Um, so osteoporosis, it's the weakening or thinning of bones, um, first and foremost. Uh, it, typically, you'll have um, some imaging done, um, testing done to confirm this diagnosis, and your doctor will work with a treatment plan. Um, the, shorter the short answer of that is no, it cannot be reversed, but, um, and it's not considered curable, but it can be um, slowed down, and um, you know, you wanna work with your doctor to make sure they, they start you on a treatment plan. There is medication, exercise, and diet, that is all. Uh, Things you can do on your own to, and you know, with the work of your doctor to uh, slow the slow the process. So definitely want to work with your doctor. Make sure that um, I I believe that it most of the time the weights um, when you're doing exercise, any kind of weightlifting helps with that as well. Um, and those medications, a lot of those are injectable medications for the osteoporosis too. Um, proper vitamin D level. We have this question about supplemental levels. Um, if you're on a site, you need to be supervised by your team. Um, but definitely vitamin D, this can be uh, a vitamin that actually can build up in your body and cause toxicity. Uh, so you want to be managed with uh, your care team on how much you're taking, uh, why you're needing to be taking the, the supplement. Um, people with osteoporosis, the, the suggested uh, vitamin D level, the range was 75 to 120. 
Um, so if you're curious or you think that you need a supplement or you're taking a supplement, maybe first and foremost you should check your vitamin D level and uh, go from there uh, for what you might personally need. Um, so, um, and again, uh, you know, everyone that's very individualized, uh, so check in with your care team. Um, thyroid and weight gain. Um, the thyroid is, uh, you know, everybody talks about that they the hypothyroidism, um, they've gained weight. Um, so I kind of went back just a little bit about the thyroid gland. It is a um, endocrine gland that's on the front of your lower neck. A lot of times when you go in for your appointments, um, they'll have you swallow so they can feel if there's any uh, growth there, any uh, dysfunction that they might feel. Um, that hormone that is produced, uh, it's secreted into your blood. It, it helps your body use energy, helps you keep warm, helps your brain, your, your muscles, all those organs working like they should. So when that slows down, um, which can be age, um, it can be other issues too. It could just be that the, the thyroid is not functioning correctly. Some of those symptoms, uh, especially with hypothyroidism, um, of course, the, the weight gain that everybody associates that with, but you think of everything slowing down. So you feel tired, you're sensitive to being cold, you have constipation or even depression, slow movements. Um, those, those are all associated with uh, a low thyroid level. Um, you, you do want to speak with your doctor if you feel like you're having those symptoms or there may be a concern. You'll want to talk to your doctor to, to check your levels and then go from there. There is medication that can help with um, low thyroidism and, or hypothyroidism, and so you want to be managed by your, your physician for sure. Perfect. My cat is on thyroid medication, so I'm very familiar with thyroid medication. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, no follow-up questions in the live chat for that. So let's go on to the last one here for you, Carla. Um, kind of an interesting one, a specific one, exposure to an ozone generator. Yeah, so a lot of people probably have no idea what in the world this is. Um, I actually took this question because I have been exposed to these. Um, I worked uh, right out of, in the college, I was working at a hotel, and we use these ozone machines. And um, what these are is they're, well, they're marketed to remove airborne contaminants by cleaning the air. They produce an ozone gas. Um, so it, this exposure to this, it can cause damage uh, to the lungs. Really, it can cause irritation, probably mostly to people that have a predisposition like asthma or a chronic respiratory disease or COPD. Um, it does cause symptoms like chest pain, coughing, shortness of breath, you know, throat irritation, things like that. Um, according to the EPA, because I looked into this, it's the the effects are very uh, reversible, and you go back to baseline typically if once you're not around it. Um, usually just a couple hours to two days. Um, now, if you feel like that has persisted, you've been exposed to this and now you're, you're still having issues, um, you'll want to talk to your primary doctor. They would probably, if you're having issues and they've been going on for a while, um, the, the type of doctor to see would be a pulmonologist. Um, they might do some pulmonary function testing uh, just to see where your baseline is, make sure there's nothing else going on, uh, maybe starting with a chest x-ray or something like that. Um, just to note, these ozone generators actually are not considered safe. There's no uh, federal agency that approved them anymore, and I don't even know that they're, they are used, so I apologize if anybody <laughs> still uses these, but um, there's really, and they, um, essentially say they don't even work. They're ineffective at removing these contaminants and they're actually harmful to our health. So um, if you are exposed to these, they say you should be closing the room that these are in and you should not be in the room. Got it, interesting stuff. 
All right, I'm going to jump in here for the last pre-submitted ones. I'm going to talk really, really fast because we've only got six minutes. So um, we do have the recording that will be on the blog. So you can listen to it at half speed if you miss anything that I say. But I'm going to try to get through as many questions as we can. Um, first couple we had on water. First is if there are any benefits of hydrogen water or high pH water. So we're not experts on any of these, but as far as the research goes, um, but background first, hydrogen water is just regular water with hydrogen gas added to it. The supposed benefits are things like increased energy, improved muscle recovery, um, and that hydrogen can increase the anti-inflammatory um, and antioxidant properties. So it helps protect damage to cells and inflammation, things like that. Um, alkaline water is similar, um, possibly helping prevent disease. That's Those are the supposed benefits. But do they work? Um, bottom line from the research I did is that more research is, need to, is needed, basically. And many experts say that even though there aren't really any known risks to drinking these types of water, there's also really no major proof to show that it has greater benefits than drinking regular water. So we know drinking water is fantastic for your health. So whatever kind of water you want to drink, drink it up because it's going to be beneficial. So again, no positive or negative necessarily, more research needed, but water is good. Um, next question was on water temperature. So this question asks about warm water, but actually the research touts some of the benefits of drinking cold water for metabolism. So Basically, your body has to use more energy to warm up drinking cold water. So while it does require more energy from your body, it's not super significant in the big picture. So I think most people like colder water anyways. Um, so my advice with this is really drink any temperature water you prefer because again, water's fantastic. It's phenomenal for your health. So whatever temperature you like to drink it at, drink it at that temperature and drink more of it. We had a follow-up question come in this morning as far as drinking too much water, if it's not beneficial or if there's harm to it. it it's really, really hard to drink too much water. Um, so I, I don't think that anyone can really get to that level where you're going to drink too much, but you can. So do some, do some, just be mindful of how much water you're drinking. But again, it's, it's like gallons of water that, that you would have to drink to have negative benefits of, or negative um, issues with it. So most of us are going to be around, you know, the 100 ounces ideally. So if you're drinking five times that, yeah, you're going to want to watch it. But most of us aren't drinking enough. So um, that was just a follow-up question that I know we had. Whoops. <clears throat> so supplements. I know Carla talked a little bit about vitamin D. So I'm going to touch on a, a couple of other questions that we had. Um, first one was just to kind of know what supplements to, to take. And we're going to go back to this. Everyone's going to be different. Everyone's going to be different or everyone's going to have different needs. So the biggest thing about supplementation, no matter what you're supplementing, is that supplementation shouldn't be a substitute for a healthy diet. OK, you can get many of the vitamins and minerals you need by eating whole foods. Now, that's not for everyone, of course. So eat your whole foods see what you're eating, see what's in your food, do some research to see what nutrients you may be missing depending on what you're eating or what you're not eating. You can also get blood tests to determine if you're deficient on certain vitamins. Um, some common deficiencies are magnesium, iron, calcium, vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin B12, iron. Um, but like Carla said about vitamin D, you don't wanna take too much either. We have to find that balance, which is why we recommend talking to your doctor about any supplements you take. And then as far as quality, um, I put the word bioavailability because someone asked about quality. So bioavailability means that your body can use and absorb those supplements. You don't just pass it out through your urine, which a lot of supplements, unfortunately, you're passing a lot out because you either don't need that much at that time or it's just not good quality. So a couple things to look for with quality, according to the Cleveland Clinic, include um, if they do third-party testing to verify the ingredients that are accurate, um, having the USP, which is the United States Pharma Pharmacopoeia seal, which is an independent nonprofit organization. So again, kind of a third party. 
And then look to keep the ingredient list small. Look for what you need, not a bunch of extra sugars or things like that. Um, there are a few things you can do to enhance the bioavailability of vitamins. Um, some work better certain times of the day. So do your research on what you're taking. Most should be taken with food, especially fat soluble ones like your vitamin A, D and E. Um, see if they have supporting ingredients that enhance absorption. That's kind of the exception to the too many ingredients. For example, like vitamin C enhances iron's bi bioavailability. Um, store them in a cool, dry area. Uh, things like alcohol, caffeine, if you have other digestive concerns, other medications, stress can lower bioavailability of vitamins. So basically taking care of yourself in general is a great way to get most the most from the supplements that you're taking, okay? All right, next questions. We got a ton of questions that I would consider more health coaching questions um, versus what Sherry and Carla are experts at. So I lumped these all together. It's 1229, 1230 now. So I'm not gonna go through all of these. Um, I'm gonna stay a couple extra minutes here just to try to answer some of them. But I do wanna tell you, we have multiple webinars on almost all of these topics. So check out our blog, which will be shown at the end, um, or shoot us an email on the topic you're looking for and we'll send you the direct link to them. So let me go to that contact information first. Um, here's our upcoming webinar. So if you do have to take off next month, using your resources, using our tracking, all that good stuff that you have um, with being a member of Health Check 360. And then September, we're going to get into beating the bug because we're getting into that illness uh, time, cold and flu season, all that fun stuff. So we want to prevent it. So we'll talk about getting that immune boost. Um, lifestyle rewards. If you do have lifestyle rewards for watching the webinars and you have to answer questions, these are going to be your questions. So again, uh, you can download the slides once our once the blog post comes up. So if you don't have time to jot these down and you do have to answer the questions, you can download that. Otherwise, um, shoot our support team an email and we can get you these questions as well. And so here's our contact information right here. Again, this the past webinars are on our blog. So a lot, almost every one of the questions that came in that I would consider health coaching questions are going to be in a past webinar. If you can't find what you're looking for, Shoot us an email, healthcoach at healthcheck360.com. I'll get you the direct link to the webinar that will help with the question that you have. Because again, we got so many great questions. We still had some coming in right before the webinar started. We want to try to answer as many as you can. Um, so shoot us those questions. We can tell you if we're able to answer it or not. But if you do need to take off, we appreciate you spending some time with us. Reach out if there's anything we can do. Have a fantastic day. And for those of you who can stay, I'm going to go back to some of these questions again, real, real quick on the nutrition questions here. Um, so calories to lose or maintain weight. Okay. Not a big fan of counting calories in general, but it can absolutely be an effective jumping off point for weight loss. There's a ton of factors like age, gender activity level that go into how many calories you should eat. If you search calorie calculator from the Mayo Clinic, you can put in your stats and it's gonna give you a general idea of how many calories you need each day, okay? But you need to know how many calories you are eating now to be able to adjust, right? So track how many, how many calories, what you're eating for a week, I would say. Then if you're maintaining your weight with what you're eating now, you can look to lower a little bit. If you're gaining weight, you can look to lower a little bit. If you want to gain weight, um, then you can look to increase, obviously. Um, so it takes about 3,500 calories to lose a pound. So if we want to lose weight safely, let's say one pound a week, you're looking at 500 calories per day to cut down on on average. So you need to be careful though. You do not want to go too low on calories. So if you're getting close to that 1200, 1500 mark, again, depending on how many the Mayo Clinic says you should be eating, you don't want to go too low. Start, stop lowering what you're eating and look to increase exercise too to get that 500 calorie deficit. Okay. So again, average of 500 calories per day is a safe way to do it, but don't go too low. Okay. 
Looks like Sherry's answering some questions in the chat there. It's fantastic. All right. Um, carb counts. Uh, generally, veggies are going to be lower in carbs. Uh, general online search is really your best bet to get an overview of how many carbs are in your fruits and veggies. Um, your berries are going to have the lesser amount typically with your fruits if you're looking to cut carbs um, for things. But fruits and veggies are fantastic. Make sure you're still eating plenty of them. Uh, controlling cravings. Um, Well-balanced diet. It's all about prevention for controlling cravings. Well-balanced diet, good amounts of protein and fiber, keep your body fuller longer, and it's going to take a lot longer to digest than simple carbs and sugars. And then same thing, healthy snack alternatives. Fruits and veggies paired with a protein or a healthy fat. So pair your fruit with like a nut, uh, peanut butter, tuna packets, hard-boiled eggs, hummus, Greek yogurt, cottage cheese, other natural cheeses if you, if you do dairy. Um, even things like natural beef jerky that doesn't have a bunch of extra ingredients in it is an okay option for healthy snacks. Uh, best diets. Um, not a big fan of diets in general. If you listen to other webinars, there's many, many, many ways to eat healthy. One thing doesn't work for everyone, okay? So really it's about looking for whole foods, finding healthier versions in small steps at a time, okay? Look for healthier recipes online. Start from there. Don't over overcomplicate things. Mediterranean diet is a good diet. Um, that's the next question. You can do it without fish. The only thing that you need to want uh, to, the only thing you're going to miss is the healthy fats. Fish has a ton of good healthy fats in it. So that's why it's a big part of the Mediterranean diet. But there's also fruits and veggies and whole grains in the Mediterranean diet. So go for it. Um, Long-term effects of keto. It's going to be the last couple that I'm going to do here. Um, biggest thing research is showing with long-term, um, doing keto long-term, I don't know if this is long-term effects or long-term doing keto. I wasn't sure what the question was, but it limits your fruits and veggies and whole grains, right? So you might end up lacking in vitamins and minerals. Um, there could be, there's some research that points to issues with people that already have kidney issues, but more research is needed. I think it just goes back to my point earlier. You don't need a diet. You just need to keep it simple, more water, more whole foods, less process as much as you can. You don't have to be perfect. Just make progress. Okay. Progress over perfection. We say it all the time. Someone said Weight Watchers. They're all about balance. Yeah. And again, multiple, multiple ways to eat healthy. Just try to get in good foods when you can. And that goes along with the last question here, changing your mindset. Massive, massive topic, right? Um, this one's so individual and, and not going to be able to do it justice. Again, we do have some emotional eating webinars and things like that. But to keep it simple, be mindful of why you're eating, right? Are you eating because you are actually hungry? Are you stressed? Are you sad? Are you mad? A lot of times changing your relationship with food requires you to make changes in other areas of your health like stress management, okay? Also being on a quote unquote diet and having that diet mindset can cause issues too. So again, reframe how you're eating and what you are thinking about your food. So again, ton more to say here, but just start to be mindful of the why you're eating first and go from there. Again, if you want links to the webinars specific on some of these topics or other topics, again, so much that we didn't cover, but thank you. This obviously means we have to do this webinar more because Sherry and Carla are amazing. Um, but please reach out with questions that we didn't answer or any questions that pop up. You can always set up a health coaching call as well to talk with our coaches. Or again, we can we can get out. I can touch base with Sherry and Carla and we can hopefully answer some other questions that pop up as far as more on the medical side. So, all right, eight minutes passed. I knew I was gonna do this. So I hope you have a wonderful rest of your Wednesday. Thank you for joining us and we will see you next month.